Well, hi, everyone. Uh, very glad to have you here. Um, it seems like we have a lot of different time zones in the Zoom call, so thank you all for making an effort to, to join in today. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about databases and about MongoDB and walk you through a demo example. Um, so here's a brief agenda for what we're going to go through today. Um, we're first going to talk a little bit about who we are and how we got into computer science and software engineering. And then we're going to talk about the MongoDB summer internship program to give you a little bit of an idea uh, of what you could choose to be involved in in the future. Um, and then we're going to go into something kind of like databases 101, where we're going to explore relational versus non-relational database models and have some common ground definitions in the database sphere. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about MongoDB Atlas and then specifically uh, Atlas Serverless, which is the team that Tristan and I work on. Uh, and then we're going to walk you through a demo of using an Atlas cluster. So to get started, uh, I'm Betsy. Hi. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, and I love the outdoors. And that's why there's a photo of me hiking here. Um, it's actually a miracle that I ended up majoring in computer science and becoming a software engineer because I explicitly told myself I wasn't going to do that when I was about five years old. Uh, the first time I tried to program was when my older sister, who's eight years older than me, tried to show me that it was possible to create animated stories on an app called Alice. I don't know if you, any of you have heard of that, but it's essentially an app like Scratch from MIT that helps kids become more comfortable with coding. And I remember feeling so frustrated from not understanding how I could manipulate like the drag and dropped pieces of code. Uh, so I developed this like mental block against coding and vowed to pick a different passion from my 13 year old sister at the time. Um, but then in high school, I decided to give it another shot because I loved math and excelled in it and tech really did seem like the most exciting industry to work in. So I took the intro to computer science class at University of Washington. And I loved the material in that class, understood it, and realized I shouldn't have judged the entire practice so quickly from such a young age. Uh, and so after that, I continued exploring computer science in university and ultimately decided uh, to major in it because I'd grown to love the work. Um, so here's a little bit more about uh, what I did in college. I wrote on the varsity crew team and sang in an acapella group there. And I had a few internships between my school years and ultimately, I ended up at MongoDB because I loved the people that I met during the internship and during the application process, actually. Uh, and I thought I'd get to learn a lot from all of the smart and friendly people and the type of work that we do, because it really is highly technical. So, Tristan. Amazing. Thank you, Betsy. Everyone, my name is Tristan. Uh, and as Betsy mentioned, uh, I'm a software engineer at MongoDB. And my origins were pretty similar. Uh, they started off in high school and I took a computer science course. And unfortunately I didn't do so well in it at first. Uh, so I also kind of wrote off computer science uh, and going into university, I really thought I was gonna go into business until my grade 12 year. Uh, and I was introduced more into engineering from my childhood friends. Uh, so I ended up attending McMaster University to study computer engineering. Uh, if anyone is from the GTA area and, you know, Pickering High School, that's actually where I went to high school, go Trojans. Uh, and then in university, I kind of fell in love with software engineering after taking a uh, software engineering course in my first year. And that grew into doing a couple internships, uh, as you can see below, well, simple, uh, MongoDB and Cash App. And uh, after doing an internship at MongoDB, I just really loved my summer here and decided to join full time. Now I've moved from Canada and I'm based out of New York. And then on the right, uh, just a little pic of me the summer before I came to New York, I did a little trip to Egypt. So now we're gonna have Natalie tell you guys a little bit about the internship program here before we dive into more of the technical programming. Awesome, thank you both. Um, my name is Natalie. I am, as Betsy said, program manager on the campus team. Um, and for those of you who might not know what an internship is or an internship program, um, basically it's my job and the job of the internship program is to have students 
like all of you um, who come from university to work at the company for the summer and really get a chance to see what it's like to work at MongoDB um, and get to know our people, our culture. Um, and so today I would love to tell you a little bit more about the company, about our culture. It's a really special culture, in my opinion, my personal opinion, a little biased. Um, and culture is really the way in which we work together as a company. Um, and also excited to tell you a little bit more about what this internship program is, what we do, and what you could possibly, you know, take advantage of in the years to come. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about who we are as a company. And I'd like to start this out by going over our company mission. This is actually a brand new mission that was just released this year. And so our mission is to empower innovators to create, transform, and disrupt industries by unleashing the power of software and data, which Betsy and Tristan will tell you all about in a little bit. Uh, but as I mentioned, culture before uh, being the way that we work together as a company, we do have a set of company values that are phrases to sum up how we interact, how we collaborate, and just live and work together and carry out that um, overall common mission I just mentioned. And so these are our six values. They really drew me into the company. Um, be intellectually honest, build together, embrace the power of difference, make it matter, own what you do, think big, go far. Definitely sounds very inspiring. <laughs> um, but I'm curious to put you both on the spot, uh, Betsy and Tristan. Maybe Tristan, if you want to go first, what would you say is your favorite company value? Uh, that's a good question. They're all so, so cool. I think uh, building together, honestly, is a great value. Uh, just love building with my team uh, and asking the more senior engineers for help all the time. You know? Love it. What about you, Betsy? Uh, I really like own what you do. Um, I think all of these are really important values, but uh, I think that being able to have ownership over your work is really important. And I think it's really empowering, especially early in your career. I love all of them. My, my favorite one changes every, every week. Um, but if we go to the next slide, another thing I wanted to also talk about that is woven into our culture um, is the idea of diversity and inclusion. Um, and so with one of those values being embrace the power of difference, it's important to share, I, I personally think, important to share with all of you how we as a company view and value diversity and inclusion. So for diversity, that really means bringing in and attracting and hiring people with diverse backgrounds, right? Diversity of thought, different experiences, maybe for our intern class, right? We have a mix of different genders, different schools, different universities. We have it's a global program. We have all these unique perspectives coming together to really change and innovate. And that's where you're gonna find the innovation, right? If we, I always say, if we had everyone from the same school, the same university coming to work with us, there you wouldn't really have diversity of thought. You wouldn't innovate. You wouldn't come up with that creative, um, just new approach, right? So, but also the second piece of that, so that's the diversity piece. The second piece is inclusion. And once people are here in the company, you can't just hire diverse pre people, but not, you know, foster their growth and um, help them throughout their whole life cycle as an employee. So we really need to foster that culture of belonging so that they feel they can bring their whole self to work each and every day. Um, so by weaving in Embrace the Power of Difference in everything we do, that really helps us innovate and helps us become a better company. So in hearing all of that, the values, the mission, a little bit about what we, you know, what's important to us as a company, you might be thinking, oh, maybe this is a place that I would want to work at or have a career at one day. Um, and the internship program is a perfect way for you to test out if MongoDB would be that company for you. And Betsy and Tristan are perfect examples of students that went through the program and then chose, uh, thankfully, <laughs> to come back as full-time employees. So we're so glad you're here. Um, and in terms of the elements of our internship program, what really makes it unique? So first of all, mentorship. 
that I think is the hallmark of our program. Um, you will have so many people supporting you throughout the internship, whether it's your technical mentor who's part of your team, your campus mentor, so someone from my team will be there guiding you through your experience, or maybe your affinity group mentor, which I'll talk about in a little bit. There's a lot of informal mentorship along the way, and we're really rallying around all the interns to help them have a good summer. Um, learning and development, so we'll make sure that you have some personal growth and development courses. Um, social events, we can't forget those, so we do things like a Central Park Hangout. We're doing a talent show, which I'm really excited about this year, a volunteer day, so you'll have that time outside of work to really connect with um, your fellow interns and, and fellow employees, and then our speaker series. So that's a chance for you to hear from leaders, hear their perspectives, hear their stories, and um, you know get to know them from a more personal side too. And then finally, some of the fun perks. Um, I mentioned before the mentorship through the affinity groups. And so affinity groups are a place where you can find community with a shared identity or shared background that you have. So for example, I'm a part of MongoDB Women and that's a group where we have networking events, we have um, mentorship opportunities and really just a support group within the company. So we have a bunch of those that you can join and choose from. We also have so many Slack groups. Um, I didn't, you probably all know what Slack is maybe better than I do because you're in a technical uh, space, but I never knew Slack before MongoDB and it's been amazing. Um, a lot of pictures of dogs coming through. We have a cookie club or there's a TikTok Slack channel, you know, you name it, we have it um, to keep you, you know, engaged and connecting, as well as perks. So we give you as interns, you get paid time off. So you get vacation days that you can take. We have, you can see behind me, um, ping pong and a pool table in the office, plenty of free snacks. It's your typical tech company. If you close your eyes and picture, you know, people going around on scooters, we have all of that fun stuff. So um, all of that is there for you to utilize. So if this sounds like something too good to be true, wow, amazing culture, amazing perks, cool work, um, you know, stay in touch with us. We would love to one day, you know, have you come through the door and say, wow, I attended this session at Learnathon in 2022, and now I'm an intern here. Um, we would love to have you. So please stay connected. Feel free to follow us on social media and definitely check out our blog too. If you just search MongoDB blog, you can check that out as well. That's everything I had. Any questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Natalie. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute or send them in the chat. But uh, yeah, please follow us. And thank you so much, Natalie, for sharing about the program. Um, it was a great experience for both me. And I think I can speak to Tristan's experience as well. Uh, we both really enjoyed our summer. So would recommend uh, staying in touch and considering it for future internships. Yeah. All right. Uh, it looks like we haven't had any questions come in about that yet. But I'm, oh, Beatrix. Nice. You live close to Seattle. Very cool. All right, <laughs> I think uh, I'm gonna get started on the content then um, about databases. So I guess digging into it a little bit more, uh, I'm sure there's a wide range of knowledge on the call right now. So we're gonna go over some quick common definitions about databases to make sure that we're starting our demo with the same base understanding. So if you have any questions throughout this, please feel free to unmute yourself or send a message in the chat and Tristan can interrupt me and be like, hey, we have a question. Uh, so yeah, here we go. Um, so my goal for the next about 15 minutes is to get you to a place where you understand this sentence. So MongoDB is a non-relational document-based database management system. And I know that that's a mouthful flooded with lots of buzzwords. So we're gonna take a step back and break down some common database concepts to help you all understand a bit more about the database market and what options are available for storing your data and where MongoDB fits into the realm of possibilities there. So to start, a database is a broad term for the storage of organized data, and we can interact with that data through a database management system, or DBMS for short. 
many types of database management systems exist, and MongoDB is just one example, but a little bit biased, the best one. <laughs> so CRUD examples or CRUD operations are the four basic operations that are used to interact with data. And CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete. And a query language is used to execute these operations. And some examples of common query languages include SQL and MQL. And we're going to talk a bit more about those later on. Uh, and lastly, a database model is the underlying structure of a database management system. And it forms the basic structure that the architecture of a database has to follow. And many different models exist for databases, but most database models are grouped into two categories, and those are relational and non-relational. So we're gonna dive a bit deeper into the differences between these two types of database models and what the trade-offs are between them. So to start that comparison, let's talk a bit about the differences in how data is represented in these different models. So relational databases use tabular structures with rows and columns to group and connect related data. And you can see in the diagram on the left here that these tables represent people and a handful of attributes that they possess. And some relationships are stored by matching the number stored for city or role in the larger table to the tables storing city and role data explicitly. And SQL or SQL stands for the Structured Query Language. And that's the query language used for relational databases uh, that use this tabular model. But on the other hand, non-relational databases use alternative structures to represent relationships between data. For example, the document-based model is one of the most popular models for non-relational databases. And the diagram on the right displays the same data as the diagram on the left, but this time in the structure of the document-based model. So here you can see that each person is represented by a bubble, which represents a document. And each of those has four fields to share all of the same information. So those four fields store the same name, age, city, and role of these people. And it's worth noting that when representing a document from the database in plain text, it often looks like a simple JSON file. So it's really easy to read. Um, and non-relational databases are more flexible by nature, and they're referred to as NoSQL uh, because their query languages can expand beyond SQL. NoSQL actually stands for not only SQL, and that represents this flexibility. MQL, which I mentioned earlier, is an example of a NoSQL query language. And that was actually developed here at MongoDB. And unsurprisingly, MQL stands for Mongo Query Language. Uh, so in contrast to the relational model with tables, the document-based model allows us to store all data related to a single observation together. And I use that word observation because it corresponds to a document. It's everything related to one piece of data. And in the relational model, the same pieces of data that would be represented in a single observation are distributed between multiple tables. And that essential difference is the basis of the trade-offs that we have to consider when we're deciding whether to use one model or another for our database. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how you can make that decision for your company. So when deciding whether to use a relational or a non-relational database, the two essential categories of trade-offs you have to consider are efficiency and scalability. And I know that we talk about those terms all the time in computer science, and it's the same here. So you need to consider how different database models will influence the efficiency and scalability of both your development process and the actual execution of your code. And the best choice for your project or for your company depends on your needs and expectations of how your needs will change in the future. It's not just about what's happening now. You have to think about the future as well. Because if you're a startup and you're gonna grow to be a large enterprise company, you can probably assume that there will be quite a few changes in the process. Uh, to dig into this a bit, for example, um, because of the difference I mentioned in how data is modeled in relational and non-relational databases, queries for non-relational databases tend to perform faster for highly nested objects. Because a query doesn't have to view several tables as it would uh, for a relational database where it goes between many tables to gather all of the information about a single observation. 
Non-relational databases are therefore ideal for storing data that may be changed frequently or for applications that handle many different types of related data. And this flexibility makes non-relational databases a great choice for companies that are scaling quickly, for example, and can't predict exactly how their data will grow and change in the future. However, a company might prefer to use a relational database because the strict limitations of relational databases requiring a tabular data structure make it easier for them to reason about the relationships between data. In other words, relational databases have a very predictable static data model. Okay, it looks like we got a question. So, okay, could you please clarify on what you mean by an observation? Is it just like a particular data? Oh, is it just like a set of particular data that you're interested in? Yes. So by observation, I mean all of the related pieces of data that go together. So if we go back to the diagram here, um, an observation in the document-based model would be one of these bubbles that represents all of the fields related to one person. So for Aaron, for example, their age is 36 and they're in New York and they're an engineer. And that's an observation in like the scientific observation sense where you would write down everything about one unit uh, before moving on to the next. Does that answer your question? Let me know if, okay, great. Glad that that helped. Nice. Yeah, and the difference there is that in a relational database model, you might have all of that information about one observation split between multiple tables. And they can map from one to another, uh, like have these pointers that are represented in the diagram, but they wouldn't be stored together necessarily on the same servers or in the same table. <laughs> all right. So moving on from that, does anyone have any questions about the trade-offs or any clarifications there? Just want to give another moment. Okay. If any come up, feel free to, to interrupt or message in the chat. Cool. All right. So now that we've covered these definitions to get us all on the same page, you should hopefully have enough context to understand at a high level where MongoDB fits into this world of databases. So again, <laughs> MongoDB is a non-relational document-based database management system. And hopefully this definition is a bit less daunting this time around. <clears throat> I'm gonna have a, a quick sip of water. Okay. So now that we have a bit of a common ground understanding of databases in MongoDB, we're gonna dig a bit deeper into how you can actually use MongoDB as your database management system. So Atlas is our all-in-one developer data platform. And that's a fancy way of saying it's a database management system with many data services built on top of the database to accelerate, <coughs> sorry, I feel like I have something stuck in my throat to accelerate and simplify how you can build with data. At its core, you can think of Atlas as software that makes it very easy to have and use a database. And we handle the complexity of provisioning servers to store and run operations on your data. And we give you an interface that you can use to communicate with your data. Uh, and all you need to do is click a few buttons in the UI or make a couple API requests to get started on our platform and build your first database deployment. And we're actually gonna do that with you later on. So there are three different types of database deployments that you can build on Atlas. And those include dedicated clusters, shared tier clusters, and serverless instances. This diagram summarizes a handful of products that we offer to make it easy for customers to work with their data, just to give you an idea of how much you can actually do on Atlas and with MongoDB. We're gonna dive into one of these quickly because it's actually the team that Tristan and I work on. We're on the serverless team. And now I'm gonna tell you guys a bit more about what that actually means because we're really excited about the work that our team is doing. And serverless technology is actually on the cutting edge of database technology and research. So it's a pretty cool area to learn more about. 
So in case you've never heard of serverless technologies, serverless technology allows users to build applications without needing to think at all about the underlying infrastructure that supports it. That can take the shape of FAS products, F-A-A-S, and that stands for functions as a service, or BAS products, which stands for backend as a service. And we're going to focus on the backend side of things because that's what Tristan and my team works on. Uh, we own the serverless instances that I mentioned earlier as one of the possible deployment types for Atlas. And earlier, uh, I mentioned these three different types of database deployments. Um, and while serverless instances are just one of those types, um, the other two are very popular and we're going to build a shared tier cluster with you guys. So compared to our other database deployment options, Serverless is the most managed database offering that we have, and it's called serverless because users don't have to worry about the servers at all. So the benefits of this model are that you only pay for what you use, so it can be a less expensive solution. You only pay for the operations that you run and for the amount of data that you store. It also has elastic scalability, so the backend scales automatically based on a customer's usage of their serverless instance. It also offers minimal overhead because there's low overhead for developers and admins in terms of the configuration work that they have to do, which lets them spend more of their time working on other things that might be more important to the company. And customers might choose to use a serverless instance for their backend if they're not sure how large their project might be or if they expect their workload to be particularly spiky. And serverless is a great option for customers in that bucket because Again, they don't pay for more computational capacity or storage than they actually use, and that can save them money. And also, it takes a lot of time and energy for companies to manage database infrastructure. So if a company has higher priorities than infrastructure management, they could choose to use a serverless instance so that they can spend as little time as possible thinking about the backing machines of their data. So now I hope you guys have a an idea of what serverless is and of what Atlas can do. Uh, and we're going to walk you through how to set up a cluster and work a little bit with it. So Tristan, if you want to take it over. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Betsy. That was a great presentation. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm just going to set up sharing my screen. Just give me one second. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Hey, everyone. All right, so yeah, we're going to jump into, now that you've learned a bit more about MongoDB, we're going to jump into a demo project actually using MongoDB Atlas uh, to build an API. So in terms of what we're going to cover for today, as I mentioned, yeah, we're going to actually spin up a MongoDB cluster in Atlas. Then we're going to model this data that we're going to put in our database using a popular JavaScript library called Mongoose. Then we're going to set up a basic API using Express, which is also a very popular node library to route requests. And then lastly, we're going to develop some middleware to process these API requests, all using JavaScript. All right. So for today, the demo application we're going to be developing is actually a library application. Uh, and we're going to be storing data about the books that are in that library. So just to give you an overview of what we're going to develop today, at the top here, we have a mobile app. Uh, this is, you can think of this as the UI or an app on your phone that you can use to access the books. Then we're gonna be developing the server, which is gonna be the API routes that we're gonna be sending requests to from the application. We're gonna be developing the controller and then the model, which actually uh, models the objects for our database and then connect that to our MongoDB database in Atlas. All right. And yeah, so I, I really want to make this interactive. So hopefully, if you have any questions, you can post that in the chat and we'll both monitor that. 
but feel free to unmute as well if you're stuck and can try and help each other out. So the first step for today is creating that MongoDB cluster within Atlas. So the first step that we want everyone to do is go to mongodb.com and we're actually gonna sign up for an account and create that shared database. So I'll give you all some time uh, to do that locally. So for me, that's gonna be going to mongodb.com and then I'll press sign in. And then, so once I'm signed in, uh, when you first sign in, if, you're, if it's your first time using MongoDB, you'll go through a little bit of a wizard there where it'll show, uh, it'll ask you a bit of questions about uh, what you want to use MongoDB for. Uh, for me, uh, it's already skipped that. So I'm just going to create my organization, which is going to hold my project. So I'll just name it Tristan. And I'm going to create a new project for today. I'm just going to call it Learnathon. All right, cool. So I have my project now. Okay, so I see this question in the chat from John Z. Probably not too relevant, but what's a data lake? I've seen it so many times, but I have no clue what it means. It's a great question. So uh, I believe data lake is a product that we offer at MongoDB where you can store uh, data outside of your MongoDB cluster in Atlas. It's actually stored on S3, uh, but you can access that within your application very easily. Hopefully that answers that. Okay. And yeah, feel free to post in the chat as well uh, if you're having any difficulty signing up. But yeah, let's continue. Okay, so now that I've created a project within MongoDB Atlas, we're actually gonna start and create a database. And so as Betsy mentioned, we're gonna be creating a shared tier database for today. So this is gonna be the free one. Uh, you don't have to pay anything for this. So we're gonna skip through this. So we're gonna develop it on AWS. As I mentioned, the shared tier cluster, and then we're gonna hit create. All right, so this is a very important step in terms of creating our database. So we're gonna create a database user using the username and password authentication method. So when you're creating your user, you want to create it with the username. And then we also want to put a password for this. Make sure to remember your password because we're going to be using it later on in the application. All right. So I'm going to create my user there. See, it's created. And then the second step here is we actually want to add our current IP address as well because we're developing locally. And so when we make requests to our database on Atlas, we want to make sure that only our computer is able to access that. All right, cool. So now I'm finished. I want to close that. Congratulations. And then let's go to databases. Okay, cool. So now I have my cluster here. Okay, so this is set up. Uh, it's ready to use. Now let's go over and start building our application. Okay, so project setup. I believe someone asked at the beginning of the presentation if there was anything that they had to download or get before we started. Uh, this is gonna be the project setup section. So hopefully you have your favorite IDE set up on your laptop. For me, that's VS Code, but you can also use a text editor. Uh, so we're gonna start with creating a new folder for the project that we're starting with today. And we're gonna be doing that. Uh, so I have a folder called Learnathon Demo 2. We're going to start by opening our terminals and navigating to that directory. And then we're going to start our project using a command called npm init. So what this does for us in terms of development is it creates that package.json file to store all the dependencies for our application. All right, so I'm going to start with that. So npm init, 
and we're going to go through the quick start that it has here. Uh, let me make this a bit bigger. We're going to go through the quick start that it has for us here. All right, so package name, we can just leave that as default. We can keep the version uh, description. Let's call it Marathon Demo, our entry point. So this is actually a pretty important uh, part as well. So we can leave this as the default as index.js, but when we're running our application, this index.js file is gonna be the starting point of our application. Okay, cool. We can skip that for now. Let's put off with me. Okay, cool. So now we reached the end of that. All of that looks good to me. So we're gonna type in yes and hit enter. So we've started our application now. Uh, as you can see, we have our package.json, and then we're going to be defining our index.js. So for today, in order to speed up our development process, we're actually going to share with you the index.js file. And you can just create the file within your local text editor. Uh, you can copy that over, and then we're going to build from that for today. Okay. So yeah, we've shared the GitHub link within the comments. Just gonna admit one more person. All right, perfect. So as I mentioned, when we ran npm init, we created that packets.json file, right? And we use that to manage our dependencies. All right, so let's actually start installing some of those dependencies that we're gonna need for our demo application. And we're going to start with Express. And as I mentioned, this is going to help us start a server for our application uh, that we can then use uh, to access from the mobile app. So Betsy's going to copy that command. We're going to take this and we're going to put it in our terminal. So we're going to put npm install Express and then dash dash save, which then puts it in our package.json. Okay, cool. That was super quick. The next step is installing .env. So this dependency, uh, when you're creating more production level applications, you might wanna give security for your application a bit more thought. For today, uh, we're just gonna kinda take a little bit of a step in that direction and use .env. What this does is we can create a new file, which is generally called .env, and this contains some of the environment variables that we can use for our application. And we do this so that we make sure not to put it directly into our code uh, and perhaps commit it to GitHub. Uh, and that'll uh, create a bit more security uh, vulnerabilities for our application. All right, cool. So we're going to take this command as well and put it in our terminal. So npm install .env dash dash save. Amazing, that was super quick. Okay, so also as I mentioned, uh, for .env to work, we're gonna need a .env file. So I'm gonna go ahead and start and create that. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna create a new file and then it's just .env. From the index file uh, that we copied over, specifically this line, this, is, uh, this line helps us to get an environment variable that we're gonna be using for the MongoDB uh, connection string. So we've called it MongoDB underscore URI. So I'm gonna define that within this .m file. The way I can do that is just paste the key, then equals, and then the value of our connection string. So where can I get that? I can get that from back in Atlas. We have our cluster set up. We can hit connect here. And this will bring up a modal, which will walk us through the different ways that you can connect to your application. So for example, you can connect with the MongoDB shell. Uh, you can connect through your application or MongoDB compass, which is another application that we provide. Today, we're gonna do connect your application. All right, so we hit next. And you want to make sure that for driver, we're 
using node for today. And this is gonna be our connection string. And so earlier, as I mentioned, within this connection string, we're gonna need our password for our database user that we created earlier. So I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna put it here real quick and don't look at my password, <laughs> but that's in there. Uh, we're gonna save that real quick. Okay, cool. All right, amazing. So we've got that now and we can just close this. All right, so do we have any questions at this point in time? And feel free to unmute as well. If not, I'll just keep going. All right. So the database and model layer. So in terms of developing our application today, we're gonna to start with the database and build up from there. So now that we have our cluster set up, we're gonna actually define the book model that we're gonna be using for that database. And we can, as I mentioned before, we can do that through using Mongoose. Okay, so creating our model. First, to start off, we're actually gonna install Mongoose as well. We're gonna need this dependency for our application. And you can actually learn more about Mongoose, uh, such as the different functionalities and things that you can do with that uh, at the website, mongoosejs.com. So I'm gonna go back to my terminal. I'm gonna put this command in, npm install mongoose dash dash save. Nice. All right. Now we're gonna go and define a schema for our book model. So just to explain a bit about mongoose, the way that it helps you to model the objects for your application is through the use of a schema. And that represents the collection as well as the documents, how the documents look for your database. So we're gonna go ahead and define that for our book model. Okay, so back in our terminal or back in our IDE, we're gonna define following good coding practices, making a new folder and let's call this models. And then within that, we're gonna create a new file because it's gonna be a book model. We can just call that book.js okay cool and so the first thing that we want to do when we're creating this model is as i mentioned we want to import mongoose so we can do that by typing const mongoose equals require and we can get that from the mongoose library the next thing we want to do is actually get that schema as well. So we can get that by doing const schema equals mongoose dot schema. And it's really helpful to do this in an IDE because you can get that, uh, that autofill there. All right, cool. So we have a schema, we have everything we need. So now we want to define our book schema. So we can do that by defining something called our book schema. Oops. And that's going to be instantiated as a new schema. And it takes an object as a parameter there. And so just quickly in the chat, uh, what sort of fields do you think would be useful to include on our book schema? Just reading there, John Z. This is finally forcing me to actually use a clean file structure for once. That's really good to hear. Yeah, John, uh, what sort of fields do you think would be useful to have uh, on a book model in the database? Ah, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, that's definitely a great answer. Uh, so title, for sure. So in order to define a field within a schema, uh, the syntax for that would be defining the field. So we put title, and then we want to let our schema know, for example, like what type uh, this would be. So we can define that also by passing in an object here. And we can say type, and we're going to make this a string. 
And it makes sense that all books have titles, right? So we can also make this required. Cool. And then I think you also said author. So let's also add that in here. Nice. And then one other field that I want to add in is actually uh, ISBN. So if you're familiar with that, that's uh, just like an identification number for books. And we're going to make that required as well. OK, cool. So this is our schema. And as we do with our uh, JavaScript classes, we want to export this from our file so that other files can use this as well. So we can do that by typing module.exports. And then for Mongo specifically, uh, we want to export the model associated with that schema. So we can do that through typing mongoose.model. And then when we're using this, we want to call it book. So when we're referencing it throughout our code, we want to reference it as book. So we'll type book here. And then the schema that holds this book is going to be called book schema. All right. I think everything's looking good so far. All right, so let's move on. Next, let's talk about the router. So for our mobile application, we have our database, we have the models that we want to use for our database, uh, and we have our application. But how can the application access that data, right? So we can do that through defining a router, which will contain the different endpoints. So that's like a URL uh, that the application can make requests to, to get that data, create new books, update and delete those CRUD operations that Betsy was mentioning earlier. So we're going to go ahead and start developing that. So first on our list, we're going to define the API routes for our model. And today we're just going to do adding a new book to our library, as well as finding a book that already exists in our library. OK, so for today, let's create a new folder. Okay, cool. And let's call it routers. And then within that, we're gonna define a router file specifically for this book model. And we're gonna call it book.js. All right. So as I mentioned, when developing our API, we're gonna use Express for that. And it's super, super helpful, super easy to use. Uh, and we start with Importing Express. Amazing. All right. So from Express, the way that we can start the server and expose that's at those endpoints for the rest of our application is through the use of the router. And this comes from the Express library. We can get that through. Uh, the express library like this and then we want to instantiate that we can just make it default and then as i mentioned we're going to do adding a new book to our library as well as getting a book that already exists in our library so within the router now we can define a post request which is typically used for creating an object through router.post And so that's going to be the path that a user needs to make a post uh, operation to, to create a new book. And for now, we're just going to put a placeholder for the controller. We're going to make it book.create. And then in addition to post, we can also do a get. So we can register that through doing router.get. And then the route that they have to get from is just the slash. And then we'll also put a placeholder there and we can make it book.get for now. All right. And then, as always, we want to export this from this file so that everyone else can use it as well. OK. And then the next step, now that we've defined the routes for the book, 
we want to also expose that within our index.js and make sure that it can access because that's the entry point for our application, right? So we want to make sure that it can access the book. And so since we just copied that, I'll just go over the code, but specifically this bottom line here, we can define the app from Express, which is started here. This is actually the Express application. And we can tell it that we want to use the slash book route. And that's the path defined here. And we want to pass in a handler, which is the router. So by importing that here from the routers directory and then supplying that to use, we know that when we hit the book path, uh, all the routes within the router file for the book are exposed to the application. All right. Lastly, let's move on to the controller. And so I really like to think of the controller as the glue between the router and the database. So the controller helps us to implement those, those CRUD operations, the create, read, and update uh, operations for the post and the get request. So let's implement that. Yeah, so uh, just talking about that a bit more, um, we can imagine this as when the client request comes in, and our, our, our application is running based on that index.js file and the routes are up. If we hit that slash book path, it's able to map to our controller, which we put as a placeholder, which was the book.create and the book.get. Uh, let me just show you real quick. So we added these placeholders here, the book.create and the book.get for our controller. Uh, and once those are implemented, it will handle generating the response that we can then return back to the mobile application. All right, so let's implement that. So we're gonna create a new folder and we can call that controllers. And then within that, we can define another file called book.js, which is gonna be all the controller methods related to our book model. Okay. So as I mentioned, this is going to be interacting with the model from Mongoose in order to do the operations. So first, let's import Mongoose again. <clears throat> and then we also want to import the model that we're going to be updating or working with. So let's import book. Oops. And we can import that from the models file. Okay, cool. And then within this controller file, we're gonna define the functionality for both the create and get. So let's just start off with model.exports equals an object. So within this, we can directly export all of the methods that we wanna have for this controller file. So let's start with the create. And so I think this is a great point to talk about this. So because we, because the controller methods are used in requests and they're actually gonna be talking to a database, like an external uh, source, we actually wanna use the async uh, field or marker here. And that lets the request know that, hey, this could take more time than expected. Uh, so don't time out on me. So we let the function know that by marking it with the async. And then for the request, the parameters here, it's gonna expect our request and response. And so we take those in and then we're using an arrow, uh, arrow, arrow function there to define the function. And then now let's think about how we wanna create uh, the book. So based on how we're using this method, we're expecting that a mobile app is going to send a request in with the data for a new book that they want to add to the library, right? So let's take that from the request. So we can do that by defining a new book. And then now we want to instantiate and create this constructor. 
And then we can get the data that we got from the request, we request that body, and then we pass that to the constructor for our book. Okay. And then now that we have that, Mongoose makes it super easy where, uh, and so just super quickly, uh, just building off of the async, we let the function know which specific line might take longer than expected by denoting it with an await. So we're gonna put in an await here, and then we're gonna do new book dot save. And so that dot save comes from Mongoose and it's super powerful. It helps us to actually insert the new document into the database within MongoDB Atlas. And then lastly, if this succeeds, we wanna let the mobile application know that it succeeds. So we're gonna take our response. We're gonna set it with the status of 201. And if you're familiar with the API responses and the status codes, generally the 200s are used for a successful response. And specifically 201 lets us know that we've created a new object within our database. Uh, and we wanna let this, the mobile application know that. So we'll return a status with 201. And then we can also return the specific object that we created by providing the JSON there. Cool, so that's a successful response. But what happens if while we're trying to save, this fails and we actually don't end up creating this new book? That's a great question. And we can actually uh, handle that through error catching. And we typically can do that through a try catch. So I'm gonna add a try here. So this function is gonna come in here and try to implement and try to run all of these lines of code. But if it fails, wanted to find a catch and then through the catch the try catch if there's an error it's going to provide it as a parameter here like this and then we can actually now set on the response a status of 400 and typically at the 400 status codes let us know that there was an error like it could be authentication validation uh, but it was an unsuccessful request. And then we want to let the user know or let the mobile application know why it failed. So we're going to throw back some JSON. Let's do some here. So here I've just defined uh, the property here, but also the value, which is going to be coming from this parameter here. Cool. All right. So now we've defined our creates. We'll also define our get. So our get starts off the exact same. We're gonna define our async request response. And so for this, when we wanna get, uh, some of the ways that we might wanna get new books perhaps are based on title, right? So when that request comes in, we can actually get that query parameter, which is the title, Doing something like this. Cool. Then now we want to make a query, and through Mongoose, that query is super easy to implement. We can do something like await. And so within the book model, We'll do a find. And then we want to find based on title. Cool. So if that is successful, we'll have found a new book. And then we also want to return if it's successful. But if it's unsuccessful, we want to make sure that the try catches here so that we let the mobile application know why it was unsuccessful. I'm just going to copy this from here. All right, cool. So, yeah, here we are. We've defined a create and get controller for our new library application.
uh, respond. Uh, just reading the chat. Okay, cool. All right. So now that we've created the whole flow, we've created the router, defined index.js, the controller, as well as the model. Let's try and test this out. Let's run our application. Okay, so we can do that by calling node. And then we can also provide the entry point for our application. As I mentioned earlier, that's going to be our index.js file. Cool. So book. Oh, so just missed. Uh, we also need to import those controllers back again. So we put these uh, placeholders. We're going to also import the book controller methods. So we can also import this in the routers file from our controllers folder and then book. Amazing. Let's try this again. Okay, cool. So now our app should be running on port 8000 and able to be accessed from our application. Okay. So this is a great time to talk about middleware. And so what I mean by middleware is, uh, this is a term commonly used within uh, software development, specifically in Node, where uh, the controller is actually a type of middleware. But when a client request comes in, we can provide middleware to do a lot of things before processing that request and returning a response to the client, to the, to the mobile application. So for example, when a request comes in, we can actually authenticate the user or we can do some validation on that request. So say, for example, we wanna make sure that the book title uh, is not containing any special characters, or we wanna make sure that the author uh, has a first and last name. We can do that through the use of middleware. And we can also chain that together uh, so that each step has to be done before moving to the next step. And then eventually we'll be able to return a response back to uh, the client. All right, so we're reaching the end of our demo here. Since we started up our server, let's actually try and use some commands to create a book uh, and then view that data in MongoDB Atlas. All right. So I've already created a, a command for us. This is using curl, which you can make a request from your terminal. This is gonna be a post request to create a book. So I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna oh, submit from a person. I'm gonna create a new terminal. So my application is running in one terminal. I'm gonna create a new one and I'm gonna do that curl. And so it looks like it returned successfully. Okay, cool. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, so I opened a new terminal and I just put that curl request in there uh, to create a new book. And so I'm just gonna go back to MongoDB now in Atlas and I'm gonna try and browse the collection. Oh, that's crazy. So within our cluster, we now see that we have a collection called books and we have one book with the title Learnathon and Tristan that I just created. And then I'm going to go back and let's try a get request as well. So we're going to get a new book based on the title. Uh, so let me share. Uh, okay, so in this new terminal, I'm going to paste this curl. And then now we can see the response, which is returning the book model. So we have our title Learnathon, our author Tristan, and our ISBN number. All right. All right. So thank you so much for paying attention and walking through this demo with us.
Uh, the code for this, if you just want to go back and look at it, is available at this repo. We have the link here. Uh, so you can visit that. But uh, yeah, that concludes our demo for today.